my lovely, lovely imps. Today, I am going to be laying out a case for the existence of a trans genocide, an ongoing and active trans genocide in the United States of America. Um, uh, I've done a lot of research for this. I've been thinking about it for uh, a very long time. As you all know, I talk about this subject on my stream all the time, but uh, I very, I don't really frequently lay out my case all in one place. So this is being all streamed with the goal of equipping you with current information as of the streaming of this in, uh, you know, late October of 2022. Uh, with the up-to-date knowledge as to why it is absolutely essential that we recognize that there is an ongoing trans genocide in the United States. Now, this is a very, very heavy topic. We're going to be talking about a lot of, uh, a, a lot of dark issues, and I'm going to be pulling from a lot of sources. Um, I have attempted to source all of my claims to the best uh, of my ability, um, and also, my goal here is to pull from sources that are easily accessible, publicly recognized, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and not niche, essentially. All of my sources that I'm, that I'm pulling from here are uh, widely recognized sources, are sources that are not particularly uh, controversial with regard to their, um, with regard to their, uh, their, their validity, um, another thing I want to say as a little bit of a preamble in this segment is I am not going to be uh, spending um, much or any time talking about uh, uh, the value of uh, medical treatment for trans people. I'm, I will probably reference this. However, I am sort of taking it as understood that if you're watching this video, you agree that HRT and medical uh, health care is good for trans people. If you don't believe that, uh, that is a different discussion. You are wrong if you, if you believe uh, to the opposite. If you don't believe that, that trans health care is important to the well-being of trans people, despite the fact that this has been broadly researched for decades, it is well known that transition, HRT, and societal support greatly increases the uh, the life outcomes and the well-being of trans people. Uh, I, that's a different. You, you, we're having it like you, you're wrong if you think those things are are not uh, are not good. Basically, is what I'm saying. Um, uh, trans people deserve health care. Trans people need health care. It is acknowledged. It is a a matter of health and wellness. Okay, so that is going to be taken as an assumption in this video. Uh, there are many, many videos that if you want to watch that you can go check out about the validity of HRT and the studies behind those things, um, about the validity of, uh, of uh, puberty blockers, about the validity of trans uh, and gender affirming health care. These exist in abundance and there are tons of videos, tons of re reports and research that's been done about it. That's not what we're here to talk about today. Apologize that I have to do a bit of a win, uh, a bit of a wordy introduction for this, but uh, I just want to. I just want people to. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to deal with any comments of people uh, attacking the validity of HRT because that's not what I'm talking about here. I will disregard you if that's the angle uh, that you, we're going to be talking about. That, yeah. If I had, yeah, if I had to address all that, this would be way too long. So instead, what I am going to be focusing on throughout this segment is going to be. Uh, the current state of anti-trans legislation in the United States, uh, the current state of anti-trans sentiment in the United States, um, and I am going to be talking about specific laws. I'm going to be talking about specific um, actions, political actions that have been taken. And then afterwards, I am going to discuss uh, definitions of genocide not just a single definition, but multiple definitions. And the goal of this is to show that with very few exceptions, no matter how you slice it, what is going on in the US right now is indeed a trans genocide. And we should treat that with the utmost seriousness. I am a very, very, very firm believer that the Holocaust was a disgusting and horrible, horrible blight on the history of humanity. It was a traumatic event that has damaged the entire planet. Uh, genocides are one of the worst crimes imaginable to the human mind. 
We can think of all, we can think of very few things that are worse than the idea of rounding up a bunch of people and harming them or killing them. We can think of essentially nothing worse than eliminating an entire group of people just because they belong to that group of people. I take this issue very, very, very seriously, and I also take uh, I also take the idea of never again uh, very, very seriously. The idea that this should never occur ever, ever again. And the more people who believe that a that a genocide, that a Holocaust-like event should never occur again, the better a world that we live in. These types of things must be fought against with all of our force. The unbelievable atrocity of, of an event like the Holocaust is so great that we, that, that the entirety of humanity pays the price. Not just, not just the people who were immediately affected, not just the countries that were involved, not just the societies next to the countries that were involved, but literally all of humanity going forward. These events harm us in unimaginable ways. We lose art, we lose science, in addition to the fact that we are losing wonderful and beautiful and amazing people, okay? So that's the reason why this is important to me. Uh, I, I take these things uh, really seriously, and I think you should as well. So, before we go uh, uh, any further, let us talk about the the sort of current state of affairs in America. And what I'm going to start with is a story that that broke today. Okay, that's how that's how uh, that's how recent this stuff is. Okay. Uh, today uh, is 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 uh, October twenty eighth, twenty twenty two, and this morning the state of Florida, uh, using a a very interesting tactic by which they bypass the legislature of the state and instead uh, appeal to the medical board um, of the state, uh, has now passed a total ban on youth trans health care. This includes HRT, this includes puberty blockers, this includes uh, 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 surgeries, though surgeries are incredibly, incredibly rare on minors. Um, and when I say incredibly rare, essentially never happen. Only in the most, uh, in the most uh, uh, extreme and, and necessary, medically necessary circumstances. So we're just gonna read through a real quick thread done by uh, a reporter who was uh, who was actively reporting this event this morning. Let's just uh, pop over there real quick. Hold on, let me just bring this up, okay? So this is Aaron Reed, Aaron in the morning. Uh, Aaron is a, uh, a reporter who regularly talks about trans issues and follows these events uh, in real time, uh, tweeting incredibly helpful uh, threads um, that are then distributed to many other forms of social media. Today was a dark day for trans youth. The Florida Board of Medicine has just voted to ban gender-affirming care for all trans teenagers. They cut the hearing early and told activists who were present to email them. I cry for Florida's trans youth. This was a sham hearing with fake experts. The leader of this hearing told activists, don't worry, you're not going to win, immediately before cutting the vote short. They relied on a report that was done in part by a dentist to ban gender-affirming care. Now, this is something that we've seen happen a lot in the United States, which is, uh, uh, which is presenting medical opinions from non-experts. You find a dentist who is anti-trans, you say you have a doctor because a, do a dentist is technically a doctor, and then you have the, do the dentist present an anti-trans narrative as a medical professional, despite the fact that nearly every major medical organization and association on the planet recognizes the validity of trans of trans healthcare recognizes the need for trans healthcare even in minors uh you can occasionally find a doctor or even a a, a set of doctors um often who don't have a specialty in that particular type of medicine to come forward and that absolutely happened today this was the moment they cut testimony early and told activists to go go home. Activists, of course, erupted. Very few were allowed to speak. Only those who were in favor of banning were allowed at first. And this is, you can watch Finish. this moment. We'll watch what it live. Mean? So here we go. We're going to watch this real quick. I watch this with before me. You, uh, you can come to the podium. You'll be the last speaker for the day. And wow. let, me, let, me, let me finish. Let me, fi let me finish. Let me finish. Don't shout. You're not going to win. Let me finish. 
what we're going to do, we'll give you an email for the state of Florida. Wow. You, you, you send your information, and whatever information that you, what information you send will be a part of the record. You know what? Okay, okay. You know what? You know what? Let's, okay, that's fine. Okay, uh, Miss Patty Sullivan, you may proceed. You may proceed. That's okay. Their blood is on your hands. That's okay, he says. That's okay. Let's have some uh, decency and quorum here. Uh, yes, let's have some decency and decorum here. Uh, Pew Review says, I was there today. All of the people they flew in, some from other countries, to pack the public comments were reading from printed scripts. Yes, I have heard that there was a pretty significant effort by the Republican Party to pack the audience with, uh, with essentially, uh, uh, basically people who supported them regardless of their jurisdiction. Now, of course, uh, that isn't even the biggest form of, of political malpractice here, but what we see on display here is the... Uh, Republican Party of Florida, led by Ron DeSantis, uh, uh, essentially picking, uh, handpicking experts for their medical review board and then instructing the medical review board to ban trans care. Now, unfortunately, this gets even worse, okay? They appeared to briefly consider allowing those already on HRT and puberty blockers to continue, but at the last minute, they scrapped that. Now, this is incredibly, incredibly concerning. They considered adding all trans youth to Florida, uh, uh, trans youth to a Florida registry, but we'll take that up at another time. This is genocide. It is happening now. Now, I don't think I need to, uh, I don't think I need to state why a trans registry, even being on the table, being considered by a medical review board in the United States of America is a concerning thing. I think that is a, uh, uh, that is a, b even the fact that it was brought up in this, in this conversation is a screaming, screaming klaxon warning you that things are getting very, very bad. But what they passed today does not allow for people to be grandfathered in. So People under the age of 21 who are currently on HRT or currently on puberty blockers are now having their medical care discontinued. Now, we are, like I said, we are already in agreement, uh, I should hope, uh, uh, if you've gotten this far in the video, we are already on agreement that HRT is very valuable to trans people. But I want you to try and put yourself into the shoes of a teenager who is now by state order going to be forcibly detransitioned. They are going to be forced to go through a puberty which causes them extreme mental duress after they already believed that they were going to be free of that. This is a absolute horrifying atrocity that is, that is literally just transpired today. And this is in law in Florida right now. And you'll notice, of course, how conveniently this sidestepped the legislature. There was no democracy involved in this whatsoever. This was done by taking advantage of medical institution, by taking advantage of executive power over the ability to determine medical institution. And it has now uh, enacted a law that is openly attempting to harm young trans folks specifically. A, a, a specifically trying to make it impossible for young trans people to get medically necessary uh, health care and in addition is banning uh, is, is sorry is, is banning those people from continuing their health care uh, even though a doctor has already weighed in that it's medically necessary if somebody is currently on puberty blockers or HRT, they've already met with a doctor. They have already had a doctor determine that this is a medical need. And the state has said, we don't care. This is, in our opinion, a moral wrong. This is a violation of norms, and you are no longer allowed to do this. And of course, this means that doctors who continue to do what is medically correct are going to be targeted and prosecuted.
The ban is going up for a vote on November 4th. It's not law yet. Well, we will, uh, that, okay, uh, I don't know about, I don't know about that specific thing. I don't know how far this has to go uh, before uh, it, it directly affects people. But what we do know is from precedent that these uh, statements going into play already makes doctors stop because doctors can't, I mean, no doctor can risk a fucking felony. No doctor can risk a, a, a severe violation of medical ethics. It will ruin them. So they just stop serving trans patients. Even, even before a law goes into full effect, and we're gonna talk about another example here in just a second, uh, this already starts to negatively affect trans people. And I promise you, don't worry, we will talk about every single level of the, uh, of the, uh, of the law being 100% uh, uh, 100% enforced across the state to partial enforcement to even just the threat. We're going to talk about all of that. Okay? Let's continue. So, um, this thread continues here. In the coming weeks, we will need to begin supporting refugees from Florida. If you are in Florida and you need a place to flee, this is my anti-trans legislative risk map. The dark blue-green states are the best. California, Massachusetts, and Connecticut have passed explicit refugee protections, which is pretty good to know. If you are in one of the states, if you are in one of these red states, uh, uh, California, uh, California, Massachusetts, and Connecticut have passed refugee protections. If you flee there, you have the protection for, as a refugee. So there is nothing that those states can do to persecute you. Uh, outside of the fact that they drove you from your home, okay? So keep that in mind. Those are the three states that have currently done that. This is the current map of trans uh, legislation as maintained by, by, like I said, activist and reporter Aaron Reed. Now, I have been able to pull from a couple of different maps, which we will be looking at uh, today. But this is the, the current state. Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, Tennessee, Alabama, Florida, South Carolina, uh, uh, South Dakota, Montana, Idaho, Utah, and Arizona are the major areas of concern here, okay? These are states that have many, many laws, and we're gonna go into detail on a couple of these, okay? But I just want us to lay the stage for the fact that as of right now, Florida is, uh, uh, via a, a, uh, a medical board system, forcing children to, who have already been determined to have a medical need to transition to stop transitioning. Understood? Let's continue. So, the next thing that I wanna talk about, oh yeah, yes, 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 sorry. I, I wanted to bring up one more thing concerning Florida real quick, and that is this statement by the Human Rights Campaign. This was, uh, this statement was made on August 4th of, two th of 2022. So this was a statement that was made before, uh, long before this actual hearing happened, when the hearing was first, uh, was, was first proposed. Human, human rights campaign condemns Florida Board of Medicine for considering Governor DeSantis's politically motivated proposal to ban affirming care for transgender youth. This was, this was three months ago, yes. Tomorrow, the Florida Board of Medi Medicine will discuss to meet thoroughly debunked rule changes proposed by the Florida Department of Health that would be contrary to all medical ba uh, best practices, deny gender-affirming care to Florida's transgender youth. The FDOH, an agency under the control of Governor DeSantis, so you see what I was talking about, how he's using uh, executive authority to put these things through, that this isn't even going through the legislature as we would normally understand it, is pressuring board members to reject their best medical judgment and impose political barriers to accessing life-saving care for transgender youth and adults. The Human Rights Campaign, the nation's largest lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer civil rights organization, denounced the transparently political move that seeks to take decisions about best care practices out of the hands of medical professionals and patients. So I just want this to be clear here. This is a statement, and by the way, another statement was issued today. I just want to be clear that this was a statement that was formally released, and there was another statement that it says basically the same thing that was released today, uh, released by one of the foremost human rights organizations organizations, civil rights organizations on the planet, one of the most well-respected human rights organizations on the planet, and they are explicitly saying that this is a job, this is a, a, uh, this is a set of, le uh, of legal pre precedents that will uh, deny life-saving care for transgender youth and adults. And we all have already agreed, like I said, hopefully, 
that we acknowledge that trans healthcare is uh, is life saving. That it is incredibly it is incredibly impactful to trans people. Now, the rest of this article is incredibly useful, though it is a little bit beyond what we were discussing here. Uh, this this uh, uh, article is very useful. I'm going to be posting it in chat right now. Here you go. If you, if you would like to take uh, a copy of this, I'm posting it in both of my chats, uh, you can use this to help debunk uh, a lot of the lies that are being put forward specifically by the Florida Board of... Uh, uh, of uh, of medicine, the Florida Board of Medicine. So in here, they go through the claims that are being made by the board and they are debunking them one by one. Honestly, this is a very good article. Uh, do you see what I mean? It's things like this. The agency found that puberty blockers are not approved by the FDA for treatment of gender dysphoria, are not medically efficacious, et cetera, et cetera. The reality, and then they have the actual facts they have the actual facts as cited directly from various medical organizations. This article is very helpful. Again, beyond the scope of what we're talking about, I simply wanted to establish the fact that uh, the claims that there is uh, severe damage to mental health and life are being recognized and repeated by some of the foremost or, uh, act, uh, um, activism organizations in the entire world, okay? Now, Florida, is unfortunately not the only state that has engaged in this, not even by a close margin. Of course, there were two other uh, uh, particularly shocking bills uh, that have succeeded uh, in, in the United States. The first of all, the first that we've seen recently, um, was from Arkansas, and the second was from Alabama. Uh, Arkansas and Alabama both uh, put into law bans on gender-affirming health care for uh, anyone uh, under the age of 21. Now, that's pretty extreme, given that, uh, you know, being an adult is usually at 18, but uh, uh, but the push has been to, to criminalize it under 21, which is uh, certainly an interesting decision. Um, but uh, uh, the, both of these states have enacted laws that are specifically targeting transgender health care for minors. Again, a medically necessary process for people who are working with doctors who have medical oversight and who have parental oversight, as it turns out. Uh, this, is a, this is a little citation for this. This was from May 6th of 2022. Alabama judge considers whether to block a new ban on gender affirming care for youth. Now, this is a whole article that goes into this, but the short, the long and short of it is a discussion specifically as to whether a federal judge is going to block it. The good news about these two laws is that as of now, both of these laws have been held by at the federal level. So the law was put into place and they have been, uh, they have been blocked and put on hold for further litigation at the federal level. However, I want you to acknowledge that on the state level, these laws are in action. So. Uh, it's really complicated. In the United States, we have a federal government and we have state governments. And these, the, the power of those governments uh, really waxes and wanes. For example, uh, a lot of states in the United States currently have, um, uh, uh, a lot of uh, states in the United States currently have uh, legalized or decriminalized cannabis. Uh, and that is federally illegal. So it is, no, it is actually quite common for states to disagree with, uh, with the federal government on various issues. Now, sometimes this causes a major issue and the federal government intervenes. Sometimes they intervene very severely. Other times they don't intervene at all. And what we're seeing here is that we're seeing blocks go through for these, but we have no idea where they're going to go after that. And we have no idea how that's going to affect the current practice of medicine. And in fact, it's very likely when you have a, a felony level ban that this is going to have a severe chilling effect on, on medicine in the area. That doctors will be unwilling uh, to, uh, to take people uh, in and, and give them the HRT they need or the puberty blockers that they need that doctors will be uh, reluctant to specialize in trans health care. It essentially represents an attempt to choke out health care for trans people. Again, necessary health care.
this is this is the current state of affairs in Alabama and Arkansas. So we have a medical board ban in Florida. We have two legislative bans in Alabama and Arkansas. And now we're going to talk about another thing, which is Texas. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know, Texas is a fucking huge state, okay? The population of Texas is 29.5 million people, okay? So just the state of Texas alone has 29.5 million people in it. And just so that we get a little bit of historical perspective here, uh, the, the, the population of Germany uh, in 1933 was 65 million. So the population of Texas right now is just half of that of the entirety of Germany at the beginning of uh, at largely at when the first camps were opened in Germany. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about the Holocaust directly during this segment, but I thought that that was a very, very, very interesting parallel to make, just so you understand the scope of uh, the scope of, of people who are being affected here. Also, just out of curiosity, the population of Florida is 21.78 million. So essentially, uh, if we are considering Florida and Texas, Alabama and Arkansas as the states that have currently uh, made extreme attempts to, to ban, successful attempts to ban trans medicine, uh, we are looking at a population greater than that of Germany at the beginning of the first opening of the camps of the Holocaust. Okay, just so that we can, just so we have a scope of how many people are affected by this, okay? And we're gonna do a little more math in just a little bit, but let's talk about what happened in Texas, okay? In Texas, uh, <laughs> now what happened in Texas is, is one of the more uh, uh, legally controversial attempts at a trans ban. See, because what happened in Texas is that uh, Texas has had a lot of anti-trans bills. I, I actually just wanted to show you this real quick. So this was a tracker that I was able to find that was for the year of 2021. So in just 2021, not to, this is not counting anything in 2022, Texas had 30 plus anti-LGBTQ bills go through their legislation. Now, Texas is an odd state because there's it's a red state, but there's also a lot of Democrats in some of the major cities. So a lot of these things in the legislation actually reach some level of, uh, of uh, pushback. And as you can see in 2021, 30 plus anti-LGBTQ bills were, uh, were, uh, were defeated. That includes bills that were sports bans, that includes uh, uh, affirming healthcare bans. But in 2022, a interesting, uh, an interesting little thing happened, which is, let me just bring this up real quick. This is a letter from Ken Paxton, the Attorney General of Texas. I know everybody, I know everybody's gonna want me to talk about all the shit that Ken Paxton has been involved in, but we're not gonna talk about that here, even though it is funny that Ken Paxton literally fled from the state of Texas because he's in trouble with the law. We're not gonna talk about that right now, but uh, Ken Paxton, the the extreme Republican governor or attorney general of Texas, issued a legal uh, a legal statement. A.G. Paxton declares so-called sex change procedures on children and prescription of puberty blockers to be child abuse under Texas law. Now, I'm not going to sit here and read all of his his drivel because I'm not here for that. You can go look in that, into that yourself. But this is a declaration that not only is a medical practice which is accepted and acknowledged as valid by every major medical institution on the planet, um, not only is he claiming that this is a bad thing, but specifically that it is child abuse. And that might seem like an extreme claim at first until you realize what the political motivation was that uh, for that was the political motivation for claiming that it was child abuse was the following letter that was written by Governor Greg Abbott. You see, after uh, Attorney General Ken Paxton wrote his letter claiming that, uh, that medically necessary health care for trans kids was child abuse, Governor Greg Abbott then used his executive power to issue an order in order to prosecute trans parents and doctor, uh, parents of trans kids and uh, and doctors who were prescribing puberty blockers to uh, trans kids 
uh, as participating in child abuse. And he did this by citing the legal opinion of the attorney general. Now, like I mentioned, Texas has shot down a lot of legislation, uh, anti-trans uh, legislation. Um, uh, uh, so, so the legislation, uh, the, the democratic process has shot down all of these bans. And so Greg Abbott found a way around this. Now, uh, a lot of things happened as a result of the, uh, of the, of this Texas law coming into place. And I wanted to cite just as a small example of this. Okay, real quick. I'm going to, I'm going to cite, cite some incredible reporting that was undertaken by NPR, uh, uh specifically about this bill. This is an article called, In Texas, an unrelenting assault on trans rights is taking a mental toll. And I want to bring a special attention down here uh, 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 to a, a small bit here at the end, okay? Between 2020 and 2021, the Trevor Project saw a 150% increase in crisis contracts, contacts from LGBTQ youth in Texas seeking support. And, and also here, Further going into that, an organization dedicated to suicide prevention for the LGBTQ youth, that is Trevor Project, I hope people are aware of this, that their main focus is uh, helping to prevent suicide. Suicide, which is incredibly common among trans youth because they are overwhelmed with agony and they don't, they're young and they're overwhelmed with agony and they don't see a way out. And people like, Tex like uh, Texas Governor Abbott and Ken Paxton, AG of Texas, want to make that more of a case. Uh, the Trevor Project received more than 10,800 total crisis calls, texts, and chats from LGBT youth in Texas looking for support between January 1st and August 30th of 2021. And that was before these explicit, uh, the explicit laws targeting families with trans kids and targeting doctors treating trans kids went through. This was just from the constant slew of endless and endless uh, uh, trans legislation. If you look earlier in the, uh, in the article, for Amber Briggle, raising her 14-year-old trans son in Texas means packing lunches, coordinating rides to extracurriculars, and planning sleepovers. Usually, it's just like raising any other kid in America, except for when it's a legislative year. Legislative se sessions in the state which can last up to 140 days every two years, can be exhausting, she told NPR. It's emotionally traumatizing, Briggle said. I've been seeing a therapist for years, so I don't cry in front of my kids over things they shouldn't have to worry about. Anti-trans rhetoric in Texas has grown louder in the past few weeks. Attorney General Ken Paxton, who broke bread with Briggle's family many years back, issued an opinion that likened gender-affirming surgery to child abuse. Not just gender affirming surgery, he also likened the prescription of puberty blockers to surgery. Once again, we all know puberty blockers are well acknowledged by the medical community as extremely low risk, completely reversible, and highly effective. Uh, and uh, of course, there was a significant amount of, uh, of controversy after it was discovered that uh, that Greg Abbott was instructing agents of the uh, instructing agents of the uh, the Texas uh, Department, what's it called? The uh, sorry, I, the name, the Department of Family and Protective Services, that he was instructing agents to to communicate using specific clandestine lines that could not be um, that could that were not uh, uh, using their own, basically using their own cell phones, so that it wasn't on official hardware. Um, and that was after issuing a letter in which he told explicitly, as the executive overseeing the, uh, the, the Department of Family and Protective Services, that, they, that people should prosecute, prosecute families with trans kids undergoing medical treatment and doctors who are giving medical treatment to trans people as if it was a case of child abuse. Now, of course, this has uh, uh, garnered legal attention and is being litigated on the federal level. But in the meantime, the state is still going forward with this and pain is being put on these people. These are people who are, these are families whose parents are, are being wrongfully accused of child abuse currently. And I don't know if you know this, but child abuse is a, uh, is a, uh, a allegation that regularly 
invites, that regularly allows the state to intervene, to take children away from those parents and put them into the care of a parent that will not abuse them. There's a reason why child abuse is the language that was chosen here. There is a reason and there is a goal. Understood? Now, real quick, uh, uh, I've laid out now three of, or sorry, four of the worst examples of anti-trans legislation in the United States. Successful examples, mind you. These are, these are laws that were pushed into law. Some of them are being contested on the federal level. Some of them may be overturned. We can certainly hope. But nonetheless, these are states which are, given that we live in the United States of America, states are independent entities. These are states that cumulatively have an enormous population of people, and they are pushing laws that can be described as nothing other, in my opinion, than genocidal. But let's take a look at some of the other laws that are currently being pushed through. I'm going to read off a couple of laws that are currently being pushed through and the general character of these laws. You'll be able to look these laws up if you so desire it. They are publicly available. It's incredibly easy to access this. All you'll need to do is type in the law. You can go look at the text of it and judge for yourself whether I'm categorizing this fairly in the future, but I believe that I am. Uh, so these are successful bills. Successful bill, Iowa HF 2416, this was a sports ban. Now, when I say sports ban, what that means is that children, generally pre-puberty children, are being uh, forced to be categorized into sports based on their birth gender, regardless of anything else. So these are, uh, which first of all is absurd for a number of reasons. First of all, how you test somebody's birth gender is if nobody ever gets their birth gender tested, there could be tons and tons of, uh, of, of intersex people in addition to trans people who are caught uh, uh, wrongfully in the net of this law, but also it puts an undue pressure on parents and children to, to out themselves and to perform, uh, if they're an athletic student, to perform on a, on a team that they will not be on even ground with at all. Even worse so than if it had been the other way around. Um, a, if, if you're a student who is, is currently on puberty blockers, you do not have the pubertal advantages, advantages, which by the way, are highly suspect. There's, uh, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna break, breach into that, but I'm just going to state, highly suspect that there is any advantage uh, uh, from any from either puberty that that local hormone levels is really the only thing that determines any level of sports advantage nonetheless uh, that children who are on puberty blockers are being forced to go onto a team to go into locker rooms to go into uh, public spaces uh, forcibly not as who they are, as the gender they identify as this is not only is this distressing on a personal level, but it's a public form of distress. It is a thing that makes the student uh, a target. For what? For, in the name of st student com ath athletics competitivity? Student athletics is not competitive to begin with. It is about, uh, uh, student athletics is about uh, socializing, about community building. It's about, uh, it's about learning uh, how, to, how to stick to a schedule. It's about uh, sticking with a team. It's not really about comp competition. In fact, the competition levels are usually very minor and don't really even stick around for particularly long. Um, but again, other people have gone very into depth onto the actual claims. I will allow them to talk about that and I will focus on what we're talking about here, which is that when I say a sports ban, that's what I mean. I mean that it is forcing people to, it is enforcing a, uh, a birth sex based discrimination. So Iowa HF 2416 is a sports ban. Louisiana SB 44, another sports ban. Ohio HB 454, uh, which is called the Save Adolescence from Experimentation, bans trans medical care for all minors. Now this law, uh, has made it to uh, has made it into the second level of of their internal process. This has not been passed yet, but it is looking like it is going to pass, which would make Ohio the fifth state to fully ban trans health care for minors. South Carolina H four six zero eight, the Save Women's Sports Act, 
a lot of these laws use the exact same terminology and sometimes the exact same text. The Save Women's Sports Act is a, uh, a ban on trans participation in sports and also involves uh, invasive testing, including genetic testing and or period tracking. Indiana HB 1041, another sports ban. Tennessee HB 2316 and SB 2153, sports bans. Uh, Arizona HB 2161, this is an interesting one. The Parental Rights Bill. This, is a, this parental rights bill in Arizona, which was successful, allows parents to sue teachers over religious objection to sex education and LGBTQ education. It also allows parents to sue schools if school counselors do not out gay or trans children to the parents. I think this is fairly obvious why this is problematic and what the goal of this is to do. This is a law that seeks to make it less safe for trans people to speak to school counselors. Next, Arizona HB 2495, prohibition on, on LGBTQ ex uh, education as sexually explicit materials. This is a law that categorizes a large swath of LGBTQ education as sexually explicit simply because it is LGBTQ and not straight. Book banning. Uh, Georgia HB 1084 restrictions. Uh, this is a law that restricts uh, conversations about race, gender, and sexuality in school, and also involves uh, limited bans on uh, on these topics being discussed in official uh, curricula. So even if a school plans an advance, there are certain bans on what you can and cannot talk about with regard to that in schools. Um, so that is that is just a that is not even close to exhaustive. Um, by the way, if you're interested in the uh, in in seeing more of these laws, uh, there is a, a fantastic website that I uh, pull that I was able to get a lot of information from right here, freedomforallamericans.org. They have a legislative tracker that specifically tracks uh, LGBTQ legislation, both positive and negative, in the United States. It's a very good option if you want to see even more of the ones that I'm pulling from. These were just some of the ones that I was pulling from. Let me read off a couple of the ones that have failed. Once again, I bring your attention to the aforementioned uh, example of, of uh, Texas here. As you can see, this is an example of the number of laws that have failed only in 2021. 30 plus anti-LGBTQ bills were filed. It is a swarm, an endless swarm of bills. They are literally firing as many out as they can, knowing that there is no possible way that activists can keep up with, uh, with, with following and contesting every single bill. But of course, that's hardly the beginning. For example, Kansas HB 2210 was a criminalization, specifically a criminalization of providers for any uh, doctor who has or is providing trans medical health care for minors. Uh, also, Kansas put through a sports ban or attempted to put through a sports ban, SB 208. Kansas also uh, made a second attempt via the Senate Kansas SB 214 was the criminalization of providers once again. Uh, Missouri had an unsuccessful attempt, HB 2086, to ban completely the changing of sex on official documents, meaning that trans people have no, uh, have no right to privacy in that state if this law had passed. Thankfully, it did not pass. Uh, additionally, Missouri failed to pass HB 2735 and SB 781, which are sports bans. Now, you might be wondering why I'm reading off so many laws. And the goal of me reading off all of these laws is to point out that there is an absolute deluge in the current mainstream right now, this year, ongoing of anti-trans legislation over an enormous chunk of the United States. Uh, if, if, you, if you go and search the amount of laws, it, it, I can't even list them all here. These were just notable examples of ones that I was able to find and find documentation on and provide. Now, as you'll notice, I was able to locate, I was able to read off here quite a large number of successful bills, sports bans being the first of them. Now, sports bans are, in my opinion, like the least concerning of all of these laws, and they are still terrible. 
a sports ban forces people to live their private life in public, that they can't just decide who they are. It would be a sports ban is like, uh, it would be like legislat legislating what type of shoes you wore. If you wear shoes that are pink, you can't perform. You're not allowed to, uh, to, to participate in this sort of thing. It's literally saying you don't have a right to decide your identity. You don't have a right because of other people. It's terrible. Okay, and now we're going to shift into a slightly different segment. Uh, now that I have sort of uh, gone over all of this and, and uh, uh, front-loaded all of the data, all of the facts, all of the, all of the, good, the good meaty details. So you can, all of you who watch this video in the future can sit down and go through all of that. You can go and page through it all and learn about it for yourself. I've shown you guys, uh, I've made a case for some of the biggest ones. Actually, wait a minute. I actually forgot. I forgot two things that I wanted to talk about. Let me just say that these two then. I also wanted to bring attention to two federal level, uh, uh, federal level uh, discriminatory uh, legal actions taken against trans people. Uh, both of which were done under the presidency of Donald Trump. Uh, now, uh, you know, I know that it's been a very, very, very long time since Donald Trump was president. That's a joke. Obviously, he was, it's very, we've only just gotten into the, into the, uh, into the presidency of, of Joe Biden. But uh, just let us recall that Donald Trump formally banned, excuse me, all, uh, all transgender service people from the military. So no new trans people were allowed in and trans people in the military were kicked out. Now, regardless of what your opinion is on the US military, or regardless of what your opinion is on US military service, there can be no ifs, ands, or buts about exactly what this law was meant to do. This law was meant to target, marginalize, and uh, dehumanize trans people. It was saying that trans people are not good enough. They're not, they're, they're medically unsound. They're not good enough to, per, to be a part of our armed services. They are a tactical disadvantage, which there is no evidence for this whatsoever. This was again done by executive action. This was done out of prejudice uh, uh, very clearly, and it was done to marginalize and to remove opportunities for trans people. And again, I will, uh, I will just point out here at this moment, we already know, we already have it established that trans people are already marginalized, that a lot of trans people turn to the military because they have no other way of building a, a stable income and a stable career for themselves. So this was targeted to harm trans people, to make it harder for trans people to make their way in the United States. The second thing that I want to bring attention to was the uh, was a memo which was published by uh, Donald Trump's, uh, uh, I believe it was HHS. Hold on. Uh, let me see if I can find this real quick. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Uh, this is the one. It was from the HHS, a memorandum that was issued from the Trump uh, admin that was specifically targeting uh, and instructing members of the HHS how to instruct women's shelters from spotting trans people. It was literally targeted at denying trans people the access to abuse shelters. I don't think you can get uh, much more um, much more blunt than that as to as to the goal of that sort of legislation. That legislation is de denied to to specifically target people who are at, in need. It is a it is a a memo that was designed to instruct behavior in the uh, in the H in the Trump HHS and the behavior that it was instructing was how to target people who have already come for help in an abuse situation and prevent them from getting the aid they needed genuinely uh, based on pseudoscience, literally based on pseudoscience. Does this person look trans? That was the, uh, that was the, the, the aim, okay? So I wanted to bring these up because those were, the, the laws that I mentioned previously have all been at the state level. And it has been since Trump was in office, seemingly a lot of people have forgotten 
uh, about what, what happened under Donald Trump, but I want people to be reminded that on the federal level, discrimination against trans people was already in place to a massive degree. And I mean specific targeting of the well-being of trans people, denying them access to abuse shelters, denying them access to the military. I don't know how much more of a message you can get than saying uh, uh, of dehumanizing someone and de-citizening someone than saying you are not good enough to be a part of the of the military. And I am no I am no you know pro super pro military person. You all know I'm a lefty. I I, I critique war pretty solidly, pretty frequently. Okay. So now what we are going to do is we are going to move on to a, a, the, the sort of second segment of this, and the, or the next segment of this, I should say, maybe not the second. The next segment that we are going to be talking about is definitions of genocide. Now, uh, I've been talking about a lot of specifics, and I just want to remind everyone what, why we're talking about those specifics, because I am building a case here that there is an ongoing and active, a, a, a very easily verifiable, uh, uh, genocide of trans people going on in the United States right now and that it is a reason for concern and a reason for for strong political action. So now uh, in in recent discourse a lot of uh, a lot of uh, of people have brought up the UN definition of genocide. So that is the one that we are going to start with. Um, I'm going to read off the UN uh, uh, definition of genocide and then I am going to talk about uh, uh, how it applies to our current situation or if it does not, okay? So here we go. Definition of genocide under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. This is from the United Nations itself. Article two, in the present convention, genocide means that any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, a national ethnic, ethical or ethnical, my, my, my apologies, racial or religious group as such, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Now, in just the laws that I have talked about, almost all of these and keep in mind genocide means any of the following acts committed we have seen causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group this is present in all of the bands that we discussed from the sports bands which aim to uh to socially ostracize and put at risk of uh, of uh and remove the privacy of individuals all the way up to laws that are seeking to ban medically necessary care for trans people which does cause serious bodily and mental harm both in the for in the in the form of forcing people to go through a a distressing puberty that does not that is physical that cannot be undone uh and secondly to the increased rate of suicide in untreated trans people which by definition are being created by laws such as florida arkansas alabama and texas deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Once again, we have a perfect example of this in nearly everything that we talked about, but also present in the federal ban on trans participation in the military, given that lots of people seek out the military predominantly because they are impoverished and see the military as a path to success. A, a, banning them specifically has no other goal except to inflict on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction. D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Now, this is an interesting one. A lot of people don't know about this, but I mentioned this the other day, I'm going to mention it again. It is currently on the books in many states that some level uh, of, of, of gender affirming surgery is required before you can change any documents. Now, for those who don't know, not everyone who seeks out gender transition will also seek out something like sexual reassignment surgery, um, which are, you know, when, when, when the genitals of somebody are, are surgically altered to match the gender uh, to match the sex that they are aiming for. Um, 
In fact, a lot of people don't seek that out. Most people, uh, uh, or a lot of people, are very are specifically fixated on the social, the social and physical appearance of their body as a, as as how that affects dysphoria. So. Uh, having that as a requirement not only re demands that trans people behave a certain way, but also makes sterilization a uh, a well hidden a a a I'll I'll say that it was very well hidden, but a hidden uh, requirement of having your name changed. This is this is a common uh, rule still present uh, all across the U.S. Uh, although, of course, uh, this sort of legalizing or this sort of legal approach has been uh, foregone in lieu of complete bans. Okay? And, of course, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Now, this one is, is a bit interesting because uh, the children, uh, a trans kid is not necessarily going to be children of trans people. A kid who is trans is most likely going to have cisgendered parents. So while on a very technical level, uh, what, what uh, Greg Abbott did in prosecuting the parents of trans kids um, uh, does not, on the, on the most literal version of this, meet that, uh, meet that definition. I think that it is very, very well within a good faith interpretation of this reading that taking a child away from a parent because that parent allowed them to get trans health care with a medical practitioner overseen by medicine, uh, I think that fits that definition very well. Taking them away, putting them into adoption or putting them into a foster system uh, at the power of the state while it does not meet the literal letter of the law, I think it meets the spirit of the law, absolutely. Call, yeah, people call CPS on parents of trans kids, falsely accuse them, yes, of course. The Genocide Convention establishes in Article 1 that the crime of genocide may take place in the context of an armed conflict, international or non-international, but also in the context of a peaceful situation. This is important to note that even the UN acknowledges that no, uh, no open war is required to, uh, to have an ongoing genocide. The latter is less common, but still possible. The same article establishes the obligation of the contracting parties to prevent and punish the crime of genocide. The popular understanding of what constitutes genocide tends to be broader than the content of the norm under international law. Article 2 contains a very narrow definition of the crime of genocide, which includes two elements. A mental element, the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such, and two, a physical element, which we had, which we went through above. Now, the mental element, which is an intent to destroy, no one ever can can read the minds of an individual no law uh is 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 built when when they're discussing the mental element the intent the intent is analyzed by the outcomes of the law a law that prevents uh trans people from getting uh, uh from getting health care thus starving them or thus uh, thus harming them a law that prevents trans people from accessing shelters thus starving them that is how the intent is determined the intent is determined by the structure of the law not by what literally the people who put the law forward were feeling however however we can determine intent further by in by investigating the opinions of those pushing these laws and as i have said many many times uh, it is extremely easy to find transphobic sentiments being pushed by uh by uh right-wing talking points i mean i can give you an example from literally last night uh, extremely popular far-right talking head tucker carlson one of the most watched right-wing shows uh, uh, blamed the rise in diesel prices on World War trans. Uh, now, I, 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 I don't know how he comes to that conclusion, but the, 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 uh, the rhetoric is directing the, the cause of a war at trans people, that apparently this is a war about trans people, that there is, and, and, and this is just, this is just, this is one of the most popular examples just off the cuff that I remember from literally last night, him blaming a, a world war on trans people with no evidence, just because apparently the war in Ukraine has something to do with wokeness. Um, 
and 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 we see uh, other such examples like for example when Tucker Carlson ran a highly highly suspect and fraudulent story about a supposed trans teacher and ended uh, the segment uh, telling his viewers it's time to stand up and take action because this is coming for you this is coming for your kids they're coming for your kids it's pretty clear what's being called to there and this is not uncommon. This is re repeated by figures such as Matt Walsh, who has millions of followers and thousands of daily uh, commenters on his videos. This is pushed by people like Ben Shapiro. This is pushed by people like Steven Crowder. Essentially all of the major right-wing talking heads are pushing anti-trans sentiments and extreme action to protect children from trans people. With no evidence, okay? And in addition, we see that this is echoed all the way up to the highest levels of Republican leadership. We see this echoed in the, in the positions and policies that Donald Trump put forward. We see this echoed by statements uh, 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 issued literally on the daily by, uh, by active members of Congress, such as Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert, and many, many more, mind you, uh, uh, and of course, I can pull from all kinds of anecdotal examples of us watching Trump rallies on, st on my stream right here, where you are watching this right now, of us watching in real time as Republican candidates, uh, 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 Republican representatives, senators, uh, celebrities, and aspiring candidates make jokes about trans people being groomers, make jokes about how we need to use our Second Amendment rights. Second Amendment, for those who are unfamiliar, is the right to bear arms to protect children from groomers. Yeah, another example. Uh, there was a, uh, thank you very much for bringing that up, Ken Monger. Uh, there was a, a bomb threat, uh, a, a number of threats, but specifically culminating in a major bomb threat uh, that was issued against the Boston Children's Hospital after conservative talking heads accused the hospital of engaging in child mutilation. So, I wanted to go through how we can surmise an intent even above and beyond just looking at the legal intent of a law. The legal intent of a law meaning what is this law actually aiming to do? A law that bans trans people from the military is is barring trans people from a from a career path that is generally considered to be accessible to all able-bodied uh, civilians, the law is functionally classifying trans people as not able for the most basic form of public service that you can think of. That's what I'm talking about. Now, thankfully, the the UN's definition of genocide is not the uh, the only definition of genocide. Nor is it even interestingly, um, uh, nor nor is it even the most popular definition of genocide, although it is probably uh, the the most narrow. So it is the most specific, but the most speci specific definition is not always the most helpful. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read uh, a number of extremely easily accessible, publicly uh, posted and and popularly recognized definitions of genocide throughout the years. Okay. I, I want you to hear these and understand why uh, once you move beyond the UN definition, which I attest and I, I assert that the, the United States, the current state of affairs in the United States does meet the UN definition of genocide. However, I want to also drive home that many, many, many other popular uh, uh, definitions of genocide also accurately describe the, the state of affairs in the United States. So let's jump into this. This is the Wikipedia page. Very, very easy. I told you I wanted this to be very accessible so that, you know, this is this is popular, very, this is no niche knowledge, no private languages, no niche knowledge, no made up shit that everybody says all the time. Oh, you're a extreme activists coming up with terms to scare people. This is scaremongering. No, it isn't, okay? I just want that to be clear. This is literally the Wikipedia, a general use encyclopedia has quite a large number of, of very popular definitions of genocide on hand. So we're gonna read this real quick. So of course we have in 1948, the, uh, the UN General Assembly, this is the rule. So starting from there, in 1959, 
uh, Dutch law professor Peter N. Drost stated that genocide is the deliberate destruction of physical life of individual human beings by reason of their membership of any human collectivity as such. This is cited from Crime of the State, Volume 2, uh, by Leiden, published in 1959. In 1975, uh, uh, Armenian sociologist Vakan Dadrian uh, stated, genocide is the successful attempt by a dominant group vested with formal authority and or with preponderant access to the overall resources of power to reduce by coercion or lethal violence the number of a minority group whose ultimate extermination is held desirable and useful and whose respective vulnerability is a major factor contributing to the decision for genocide. Now you'll notice in both of these definitions they change the way that a group is categorized because as you can see in the UN definition, they the UN limits it to national, ethnical, racial, or religious groups. However, we have now seen through history that political affiliation and sexuality and gender presentation are all examples of, uh, of things that people can be targeted upon. So both of these, these uh, uh, publicly and well-recognized definitions uh, already exists. So let's continue. 1976, sociologist uh, Irving Horowitz. Genocide is a structural and systematic destruction of innocent people by a state bureaucratic apparatus. That's an interesting one. Genocide represents a systematic effort over time to liquidate a national population, usually a minority, and functions as a fund fundamental political policy to assure conformity and participation of the citizenry. Uh, genocide scholar Leo Cooper. I shall follow the definition given in the UN Convention. This is not to say that I agree with that definition. On the contrary, I believe a major omission to be the exclusion of political groups from the list of groups protected. In the contemporary world, political differences are at the very least as significant a basis for massacre and annihilation as racial, national, ethnic, or religious differences. Then too, the genocides against racial, national, ethnic, and religious groups are generally a consequence of or intimately related to political conflict. However, I do not think it helpful to create new definitions of genocide when there is an internationally recognized definition and a genocide convention which might become the basis for some effective action. However, limited the underlying conception. But since it would, it would, uh, it would vitiate the analysis to exclude political, political groups, I shall refer freely to liquidating or exterminatory actions against them. So this is a pretty, this is a pretty uh, strong uh, uh, iteration off of the UN uh, uh, definition, as you can see. Ukrainian-American sociologist Jack Porter says genocide is the deliberate destruction in whole or in part by a government or its agents of a racial, sexual, religious, tribal, or political minority. It can involve not only mass murder, but starvation, forced deportation, uh, political, economic, and biological subjugation. Genocide involves three major components, ideology, technology, and bureaucracy or organization. Now you'll notice a lot of these people following the UN definition are fixating on the fact that bureaucracy can be used to, uh, to enact a genocide. Isn't that an interesting development? That, that genocide scholars, f in the time that the Holocaust happened, uh, from the time that genocide was defined in 1944 and onwards, have since come to recognize that bureaucratic systems can actually be largely responsible for this. For example, if you just so happen, let's, let's make an extreme example. Let's just say that in America, a law was passed that made it harder for people of a certain race or group to get access to uh, food benefits. Many people would not immediately acknowledge that as genocidal, although if you, if you inspect it for even a moment, you acknowledge that, wait a minute, a specific group is being bureaucratically targeted for elimination or for shrinking. That is why so many of these definitions have, uh, so many modern definitions include the uh, bureaucratic nature of a lot of these, these practices. Let's continue. I want to jump ahead through a couple of these. You've got an idea of a number of these, but I wanted to jump ahead to just a couple of, uh, 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 of, of more recent ones. So here we have in 1996, uh, uh, Irving Horowitz offered a, another updated version of his definition of genocide. We just read him before. He has since, in 1996, 
reformed his opinion and states uh, as follows. Genocide is herein defined as a structural and systematic destruction of innocent people by a state bureaucratic apparatus. Genocide means the physical dismemberment and de liquidation of people on a large scales, an attempt by those who rule to achieve the total elimination of a subject people. Now, that's an interesting way of putting it, the elimination of a subject people. Um, and it brings up an, an interesting question, which is to say that how can a then that, that sometimes the act of genocide is fixated specifically on eradicating a group of people as a concept, not even necessarily literally killing every single member of the group, but instead making it impossible for that group to be able to identify itself. An example of this would be laws that make it impossible to be trans in public. If, you, if it becomes criminalized or heavily, heavily stigmatized to be trans in public, as it is in many states, including states which have, which have pushed bathroom bans, we didn't even talk very much about bathroom bans, but a number of states have pushed forth uh, bathroom bans. Um, a bathroom ban is a perfect example of a law that intends to make it impossible for someone to identify publicly as trans. What this means is that trans people disappear. They might still exist. There might still be people who in their heart of hearts are transgender out there, but they can no longer identify publicly as that because they have been pushed into the closet. They have been pushed into the shadows. Their group has been eliminated. Do you understand? Both physically and socially, but primarily socially. This is the uh, intent of a lot of genocidal actions, is not just to literally physically kill people, but to stop them from appearing as people at all, to make them, uh, instead of, I mean, we all know, what is the thing that Republicans repeat all the time about being trans? Oh, tra being trans is a mental illness. Why do they want it to be a mental illness? Because they don't want trans people to be a thing. They want trans people to become crazy people. They want trans people to become Asi to be put into an asylum. They want to erase the group trans people and say, no, those are actually, those people don't exist. They're not real. They're just this. Put them in prison, put them in an asylum. Let's continue. Martin Shaw, sociologist, in 2007 stated, genocide is a form of violent social conflict or war between armed power organizations that aim to destroy civilian social groups and those groups and other actors who resist this destruction. Genocidal action is action in which armed power organizations treat civilian social groups as enemies and aim to destroy their real or putative social power by means of killing, violence, coercion against individuals whom they regard as members of the group. Literally everything we have talked about today fits this definition to a T. In fact, most of the definitions that I have read here fit everything that we have talked about today to a T. Let's go one further, okay? This one is particularly interesting. John Cox, historian John Cox, in 2017 stated, genocide is the concerted, coordinated effort to destroy any human group or collectivity as it is defined by the perpetrator. Now, I quite like this. And the reason why I like this is because, as we know, groups are defined by the perpetrators of these things. In Nazi Germany, they determined what the groups were. The disabled, people didn't choose to be considered disabled. People didn't choose to be considered Jewish. There were tons of people who weren't Jewish who got arrested for that. There were tons of people who weren't gay who got put into camps with the little triangle. There were people who weren't disabled or didn't consider themselves disabled that the Nazis considered disabled. So I, I, quite, I find this to be quite a compelling definition because it includes it is a concerted, coordinated effort to destroy any human group or collectivity defined by the perpetrator. And as we know, as people have referenced in chat through this entire um, uh, uh, through this entire uh, segment, segment um, uh, we know that uh, uh, we know that tr that. Uh, 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 Republicans have all kinds of names and categorizations for trans people, that they are very engaged in transvestigations, that they will consider people to be trans whether or not that person is actually trans. 
And yes, as Manesh says, Nazis define disabled peoples as Leben Sincertes Leben. I don't know if I said that correctly, but the translation is life unworthy of life. Yeah, I was reading a, a article recently. Um, one of the one of the most common ways in which Adolf Hitler described a, a disabled people was as literally dead weight. It, he described them as dead weight on society. Like, it, I think the term was literally, um, it was called like um, ballast something. Let me just see if I can pull this up. Let me see if I can find it. It was, uh, I wish I could remember what the term was. Yeah, bal it was called ballast existences is the direct translation. Um, I want to find the actual word that was used. Uh, this is a bit of a, this is a bit of a distraction. I, it, the, the term that's used does not, but that's, that's the terminology that is used. And keep in mind, this is the same rhetoric right now that is being used by Republicans against trans people, uh, and against disabled people, and against immigrants. It's the exact same, uh, term, almost exact same term, literally, not German, obviously, but I English, the same translations, the same combinations of words to describe people. There's one last thing that I wanted to say on the topic of, uh, uh, of genocide, okay? And that is, I wanted to pull from yet another very easily publicly, uh, uh, publicly accessible document, uh, which is the Wikipedia article on transgender genocide. Now, this is a, a pretty major article with a lot of citations. So... Uh, if you're interested in learning more about what uh, academics, well-recognized -re academics, have to say about uh, about trans genocide, there is a ton of it in this uh, in this article. But specifically, I want to bring attention uh, to this particular line here. Historians have described as genocidal selected actions against transgender people, including colonialist and Nazi activities that occurred before the term genocide was even used in international law. Uh, Adam Jones, Adam Jones is a uh, extremely, extremely well-recognized genocide scholar. He's literally, I'm like, if you go look at this guy's route, like this guy wrote one, two, three, he wrote like 15 books on genocide, okay? But he says uh, in, the, in his 2017 book, Genocide, a comprehensive introduction that in recent years, as gay rights have become gradually more ex accepted and respected, the burden of atrocity has increasingly targeted transgender women and male transvestites. Okay? So I wanted to bring that all up. I wanted to bring up that particular one. And in fact, I think there's one more thing from, a from Adam Jones that I wanted to bring up real quick. Let me just grab this. Yes, here we go. Hold on, let me just bring this up. I wanted to, to open this fully. I didn't have that one on, on hand. Oh yeah, no, that, that was his that was the citation I had. Never mind. That's just a mistake on my part. So uh so let's let's talk about the final bit of this extended, long, very, very detailed segment. Okay. Um let's summarize and let's talk about uh, what this all means, okay? So, what I have laid out today, in summary, is an example of of a, a numerous, countless, uh, an over an, a, a preponderance of examples of American legislation that is currently uh, enacting or intending to enact, to a great degree, genocidal action against trans people. All across this country, there is a wave of, of legislation that is specifically highlighting and targeting trans people, and interestingly, almost always specifically targeting their participation in public life. My participation in public life. I am, as is probably apparent to many people, given that I uh, talk about it all the time, I am a trans person. I am a trans woman, and I'm very public about that. I have a, I have a, a particularly uh, personal investment in this subject, uh, and, uh, and 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 therefore, I really, really, really want what I say to be well backed up, and also hopefully listened to. What we have seen here today 
is a preponderance of examples of trans legislation directly targeted at, uh, of anti-trans legislation directly targeted at harming the well-being, mental and physical of trans people. Uh, it, all of these that we talked about today, none of this, or very, very little, I should say I did talk about Republican uh, talking heads a bit, but uh, mostly almost every single thing that I brought up today was specifically the state enacting or attempting to enact laws, the armed powers that be, the existing status quo powers enacting these laws against trans people with no uh, meaningful uh, evidence of harm, with no uh, scientific backing, with no popular backing in many cases. And in the cases where it is, th even the popular backing doesn't really matter because they don't have the scientific or rational backing. Um, and all of these things I've talked about fit not only a, a, a formalized definition of genocide as upheld by the United Nations, but further uh, match the descriptions of genocide put forward by some of the world's foremost scholars on genocide, people who've taken their entire lives to, de to devote to the study of, the prevention of, and the understanding of actions of genocide. I think that it would be absurd in the face of all of this to claim that there is not an ongoing genocide uh, of trans people in the United States. But more so, uh, uh, I want people to pay attention to the way that, uh, the way that, uh, 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 the, the way that bureaucracy and legalism can be used to uh, push these things forward. That, uh, that, that these rights that are, that the rights granted to trans people are already less than what is granted to everyone else. That there is an undue amount of scrutiny placed on trans and gay people for that matter. Um, uh, simply for an intrinsic trait. There are no different, but there is a, there is a perpetual uh, sort of uh, uh, employment of, of everything from the naturalistic fa uh, fallacy to invocations of religion that claim that, well, trans people are the weird ones, that, that gay people are the weird ones. And that is the, that is the impetus that leads uh, to people saying, well, maybe we should take, maybe we should, you know, maybe we should slow down on these rights things. Maybe we should uniquely prohibit the medical access of these people because, well, I don't know, you know? But p I want people to pay attention to that. That's how it always is. That's how it was in Germany. That's how it is in every genocide, in every single genocide. The laws are never 100% explicit. The, the laws are always designed to invoke uh, a, a, a uh, uh, to, to, to sort of beg the question of morality and assume a certain type of morality that intrinsically incriminates queer people. Oh, thank you very much for the kind words in chat. Uh, 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 I really want people to pay attention to this because I think that sometimes the normalization of harm can lead us to, uh, to think that, that there is nothing wrong. And I think in fact that that is a sort of a, a major operating factor of how genocides have unfolded in the past. Um, that, uh, that in, in the, in the past, uh, uh, those who have want, who have who, those who set out with genocidal intent, those who dehumanize, be it Jewish people, be it trans people, be it gay people, be it black people, um, uh, that that they they set out to uh, to have plausible deniability for their for their rules, their rules which assert a dehumanized status for the people that they're targeting, and and. And, and that they often rely on pre-existing norms of harm. Uh, there has been a, a question that was sort of lobbed at me a couple of times uh, 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 over the course of the last couple of days uh, talking about this subject, which is this idea of like, well, you know, gay people, uh, you know, X people, X group of people have been mistreated for long periods of time in history. Does that mean that there was an ongoing genocide? And the answer is maybe, yeah. Just because something has been normalized, just because you're used to seeing it, doesn't mean that thing is okay. Um, it, it, and, and often it comes from a terrible place. Um, I mean, 
if you go look at the history of like anti-gay legislation in say England or Germany, you will see that the laws, their roots go as, as deep as, as Christian theological law. I mean, an example that Doe gave me, thankfully, uh, we're preparing another segment talking about this issue more broadly, which we will not get into here, but an example that I wanted to, um, that I wanted to sort of uh, uh, bring attention to uh, is that the, the, initial, the initial laws that Nazis used uh, which, uh, to, to persecute gay people, this was known as paragraph 175 or section 175 of the German penal code. These were drawn directly from former imperial laws. Uh, the, the initial uh, uh, law that originally, that was the source of this law, where they, when they were forming a, when, when the, uh, 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 when the Weimar Republic was deciding on its laws, they pulled from a pre-existing law on homosexuality and said, all right, we're going to keep that going forward. Uh, and that law, and they changed the wording, but the, but the assumptions were the same. I'm going to read you the original law that came from the Holy Roman Empire initially, and then later was transformed into the law that the Weimar, uh, the Weimar Republic upheld that the Nazis then used. So there's a line between these things. The punishment for, for fornication that goes against nature. When a human commits fornication with a beast, a man with a man, a woman with a woman, they have forfeited life. And they should be, according to the common custom, banished by fire from life into death. This is the law that existed uh, originally in 1532 and then was changed, its wording was changed during the formation of the Republic and its, its wording changed to unnatural fornication between males or between humans and animals is punishable by imprisonment. The loss of civil rights can be recognized. So this, this legal structure was pulled directly out of old Christian morality and it carried over this assumption of dehumanization of, 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 of the right of the state to kill someone based on their sexuality. And that is very much the case now. There is a, uh, the status quo is horrible, absolutely fucking horrible to a lot of marginalized people. But right now, the, uh, the, uh, the, the eye of, 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 of these people is, is fixated on trans people. And the law that exists previous to that was discriminatory, was designed to prevent them, uh, uh, to prevent trans and gay people from ever having a say in society, from ever existing as a social group in society. And only now that those laws have been sort of pushed back against and these groups have had a, a small amount of room, are we able to recognize how bad they were to begin with? Most US states do still have sodomy laws, yes. Anyway, uh, I'm planning on talking about the sort of history of these types of laws uh, further in the future. But that right there uh, essentially summarizes uh, the extent of my case. I believe that there is a trans genocide ongoing and active in the United States of America. I believe that uh, activists, everyone, not just activists, everyone, everyone should take this seriously, both domestically and internationally especially because the U.S.'s uh, hegemonic, uh, hegemonic influence on the world does spread uh, uh, transphobia and homophobia worldwide. Uh, if America swings fash, it is going to hurt the entire world. If America continues on the path of genocide, as it is, as all of the Republicans are very clearly, uh, um, you know, uh, indicating, uh, that's really bad. It's really bad for us. It's really bad for you. If you don't live in the United States, it's bad for everyone. It is what exactly what I was talking about at the beginning, that if you take seriously the, uh, 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 the, the, the horror of genocide, if you believe that genocide of any type is bad, we should be willing to call this out. We should be willing to call it out for what it is. We should be willing to push back as hard as is necessary. Okay, uh, there's one last thing, one very last thing I wanted to touch on that I realized I didn't touch on, okay? And this is 
uh, this is just uh, it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of an extra here okay to just nail home what I'm talking about when I say that uh, the Republican Party isn't just pushing these laws they're going much further okay I'm just gonna bring this up real quick okay just one second let's take a look this is from the 2022 Republican Party platform from Texas okay so this is the official platform of the Texas GOP one of the I believe that the Texas GOP is the biggest Republican organization uh, outside of the national Republican organization. This is their, this is their official uh, platform. Homosexuality is an abnormal lifestyle choice. We believe there should be no granting of legal entitlements or creation of special status for homosexual behavior, regardless of state of origin, and we oppose any criminal or civil penalties against those who oppose homosexuality out of faith uh, conviction or belief in traditional values. No one should be granted special legal sa status based on their LGBTQ identification. This is exactly what I was talking about in a goal to destroy a group in the social sphere. No, they are asserting that they believe homosexuality is an abnormal life choice. They are attempting to establish a, uh, to invoke a Christian norm, okay? Gender identity. We oppose all efforts to validate transgender identity. All, all efforts for the purpose of attempting to affirm a person age 21 or under if their perception is inconsistent with their biological sex, no medical practitioner or provider may engage in the following practices. Intervene to prevent natural progression of puberty, which this is hilarious, you know, the idea that like, uh, that like, oh yeah, puberty, uh, going through going through a traumatic puberty is totally fine as long as it's God that did it to you. B, administer or provide opposite sex hormones. Or C, perform any surgery on healthy body parts of that person. Now, now, <laughs> this wording is pretty questionable because I would also say that this probably rules out all surgeries on any trans people, but all right. Uh, counseling methods. This is also an interesting one. Notice this. Therapists, psychologists, and counselors licensed within the state of Texas shall not be forbidden or penalized any licensing board for, practices, for, for practicing reintegrative therapy. For those who don't know, reintegrative therapy is one of the new uh, euphemisms for conversion therapy, which is itself a euphemism for torture. Conversion therapy is a therapy designed to browbeat, abuse, or physically torture a trans or gay person into being straight or being cis. Or other counseling methods when counseling clients of any age, of any age with gender dysphoria or unwanted same-sex attraction. So again, this is the official uh, stance of the biggest GOP in the United States. That is their explicit intention. Their explicit intention is to legalize conversion therapy, to ban any sort of transgender affirming care completely, to delete the existence of homosexual people as anything other than, in their minds, a dehumanized, abnormal weirdness. And I want you to recognize, by the way, that there is no true thing as normal. Normal is always invented. Norms are always invented by the person asserting the norm. Homosexuality is normal. It has existed through all of history. Being trans is normal. It has existed throughout all of history. It is as normal as being straight. It is as normal as anything else. Just because it's not as common does not mean that it's any more or less normal than the way they do things. They have asserted that their way of doing things is the normal, and that is the law that they are pursuing. They are pursuing eliminating anyone who does not fit the definition of their definition of life okay and I want people to understand this I really 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 hope that I've been able to lay out a strong case for why I believe and I believe you should believe and you should act as though because there is an ongoing genocide of trans people in the United States of America thank you very much for listening to me and uh, being patient with my long-windedness on this topic. I simply wanted to be as exhaustive as possible.